So in the previous class, we proceeded with the derivation of the lacks volinic formula. So one of the important ingredients, uh, namely the minimizer of the Hopp-Lacks formula. So we studied its properties and now it is easy to derive the lacks volinic formula. Okay, so this important ingredient yxt which is the minimizer of the minimizer in the hoplex form. Okay, so we showed that this function x going to y of xt is a non-decreasing function and hence by Lebesgue theorem it is a differentiable function almost everywhere. So at those points of differentiability of this function x, so we can define this function. Okay, so uxt is equal to uh, d by dx of this tl x minus y x t. This is uh, the function that is minimized in the Hopf-Lax formula and y x t is the minimizer and uh, this uh, for each t positive u is defined almost everywhere and that is sufficient uh, for us to verify it is a weak solution of the conservation law. Let's perform the, this derivation and let's simplify this formula little bit and by the by this w0 we are taking as the integral of u0. So u0 is the initial function for the conservation law and we can check that this. So this is locally integrable. So this w0 is absolutely continuous function. So w0 is also uh, differentiable almost everywhere. And again with the Lebesgue calculus, so it's a tricky issue. So here we are taking, for example, a composition of two functions. So one is non-decreasing and another one is absolutely continuous function. So this composition is also differentiable almost everywhere. Okay, so there are some subtle issues we have to pay attention because we are using some finer aspects of Lebesgue theory. And same thing is true here. L is a smooth function but this is only a non-decreasing function. So again, the composition is uh, well defined. Uh, uh, the composition function is almost everywhere differentiable. Okay, so let's perform this uh, integration. So chain rule again applies. So this L prime, okay, so this is D by DX. So T is nothing to do that T comes out. So once I differentiate with respect to x, so this L prime again at this x y x minus y x t by t and that produces 1, 1 by t and that t t cancels and then I have the derivative of this with respect to x. So that I get 1 minus dy by dx at x. Okay, so remember this is only almost everywhere. And similarly with the this composite function w0 with y. So w0 prime into dy by dx. Okay, again you simplify a little bit. So you take out this L prime x minus y x t and then you combine these two terms w0 prime y. So I am just writing y is y of x t and minus L prime x minus y by t into this dy by dx, okay, that partial derivatives, okay. So now we will see what this term in the bracket is. So for fixed x and t positive, this any real x and t positive, this y x t minimizes this functional. So by elementary calculus again, this derivative with respect to y must be 0. Okay, so here again 
now we are using that part of the calculus okay this must be 0 at y equal to y x t and now again you perform this derivative and plug in this y equal to y x t so what we get is minus l prime at this x minus y x t by t plus w 0 prime y x t equal to 0 and this is precisely the term in the bracket here with an uh, yeah, same thing okay. minus l prime w 0 prime. So that term in the bracket vanishes so this lacks this formula for u simplifies so hence u of x t simply the derivative of l evaluated at x minus y x t by t okay and this is referred to as lacks olini formula and now we express this l prime in terms of the given f okay so again recall so this last time also i stated that so if f double prime is bounded away from 0 then f prime is strictly increasing function so this f prime inverse exits the functional inverse okay so functional inverse and again recall the legend transform so l of y is supremum x y minus f of x okay and supremum is achieved at x star so you just take the derivative of that and equate it to 0 and that gives you y minus f prime x star equal to 0 so our x star is equal to f prime inverse y okay so this is functional inverse just remember that and we will use this notation so g is equal to f prime inverse okay so instead of writing all the time that inverse so we'll simplify the notation and now you plug in this value of x star here so that's where the supremum is achieved so l of y is y g y okay so this x is x star and x star is g of y minus f of g y okay so taking so this supremum okay, let me write that so this x star is simply g of y okay so this l of y is y g of uh, y minus f of g y and now you take the derivative with respect to y so l prime y is g y plus y g prime y minus so this is composition of f and g so we get f prime g of y into g prime y but by the definition of the functional inverse this f prime at g of y is equal to y so the last term is also y into g prime y with a negative sign and here we have y g prime y positive sign so that is equal to g of y so this l prime y is nothing but g of y and so we can now substitute that expression in this formula so our u x t finally becomes u of x t equal to g of x minus y x t divided by t and just again recall that g is f prime inverse so everything the right hand side just involves the given f in the scalar conservation law that convex f is given and the right hand side only depends on that okay and this is called Lang's Olenic formula okay so again as you notice here the important thing is played by this minimizer okay so so in order to apply just let me write apply lax holding formula uh, we need to come 
compute this minimizer y act. And sometimes that may not be easy. We'll see an example. So for any given x and t positive, so we have to only uh, compute this y act and just substitute here. Okay. And again, remember this uh, y act t is the minimizer of this function. Okay, so this earlier we call this W X T, which is a solution of the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Okay. So now we proceed with uh, uh, verifying the solution given by this function given by the well axolini formula is indeed the weak solution now a conservation law okay so let me just uh, state that just uh, Okay, so here is the verification. Okay. So now I state the main theorem as follows. So again, we have stated it many times, but let me state it once again. Okay, so we have this conservation law. So initial value problem for the conservation law u t plus f of u x equal to 0, u x 0 equal to u 0 x and these are the assumptions on the initial data. So, it is a bounded measurable function with m as its essential supremum norm and with regard to this non-linearity f, we assume that it is a C2 function which is uh, whose second derivatives is bounded below by uh, positive number. Okay, since we are only interested in this interval on the real line and f double prime is continuous, so this minimum will be positive. Okay, so that is not explicitly stated, but it is understood. Okay. Then the statement is the conclusion of the theorem. Then there is a weak solution of the IVP satisfying the following conditions. So, u is also bounded by the same m okay? and the second property that is important that is what we call it uh, entropy inequality. Okay? So, there exists a constant c such that u of x2 t minus u of x1 t less than or equal to c by t into x2 minus x1 for all x t positive and x1 x2 with x1 less than x2. So, this is one sided inequality, there is no absolute value here. So, it is only one sided uh, inequality. And I also state the third property which is continuous dependence on the initial condition. So, u is stable and depends continuously on u0. So, the statement is mathematically stated as follows. So, if u and v are the corresponding weak solutions with initial values u0 and v0, so u is the weak solution with initial condition u0 and v the initial uh, weak solution with initial condition v0 and u0, v0 
are assumed to be not only bounded but are also integrable l1 r okay then for x1 x2 satisfying x1 less than 2 and t positive the following estimate holds okay so the right hand left hand side is the integral of u minus v okay at time t integrated over the interval x1 x2 and right hand side is the integral of the initial values u0 and v0 integrated over x1 minus at x2 plus at so there is a spread of uh, the uh, initial interval so this is so you can see again finite speed of propagation okay and speed is given by this number a which is maximum of a prime mod f prime u again in that same interval mod u less than equal to m and we also put this mu as infimum of f prime u mod u less than equal to m and since f prime f double prime is continuous and we are assuming that it is greater than 0 in this interval so its infimum will be positive and the constant c in the second statement this uh, entropy inequality depends only on this m mu and a okay this inequality two is termed as entropy inequality as you see it's really an elegant inequality which does not involve directly okay, at least uh, any condition on the uh, characteristics or the values of the function as it approaches a uh, discontinuity curve so they are all hidden they are all hidden and end up in a this nice inequality and this inequality can also be rewritten as so instead of x2 x1 so we use only one variable and then use all a positive so u of x plus a t minus u x t divided by a is less than equal to c by t okay so very neat uh, form of uh, entropy condition earlier we discussed that in terms of uh, characteristics and sh that shocker okay but here you don't see any of those things it directly involves the solution itself that weak solution okay so before uh, going to prove the statements in the theorem so i will not be handling this part 3 that's uh very deep and technical and takes many hours of calculations and presentation so you can refer to some literature for that and that's an important so put together okay so this uh say that this initial value problem is well posed in the sense of hardmart so you have okay uniqueness i have not discussed so i'll uh, discuss that thing in a little bit but there is a continuous dependence on that okay so uniqueness also is just uh, ah okay let me just discuss uh, that uniqueness so any weak solution satisfying the entropy inequality is unique so let me just elaborate little bit on that you know this part okay so suppose
u1 u2 are weak solutions of this conservation law and same in self condition of course and both satisfy uh, entropy inequality then q1 equal to u2 or whatever so that is the uniqueness okay and again this uniqueness proof of uniqueness is quite technical and it uses some more tools from the analysis uh, so that smoothing and other things uh, so i will not do that uniqueness part also so it's uh, very cumbersome so you can just uh, look into our book where a detailed uniqueness proof is given okay you have to use mollifiers to smooth the so these remember these are only almost theory where defined functions okay and not at all differentiable in the usual sense okay so we have to uh, first smoothen them out and then derive lots of inequalities so it's very very technical this proof of this uniqueness theorem is very technical so i will not uh, venture into that okay so let me just mention this smoothness result that is coming out of uh, this theorem okay so namely this entropy inequality okay so that's so it contains some uh, regularity result for the solution okay so remember to begin with u is defined uh, only almost everywhere and u satisfies this integral equation in order to be a weak solution okay so you don't see anything further uh, in the lax solinic formula but this lax this entropy inequality allows us to say something more on the solution okay so that's what now i want to highlight okay this uh, for each t positive this function x going to u x t so this is given by the lax solinic formula which satisfy the entropy inequality is a bv function so let me stress there on any interval yet so it's a local Uh, result so it's locally a bounded variation so you cannot take it to the whole of r okay that it could be bounded unless you put more assumptions on the initial condition so this u will not be a bounded variation function on the entire r but this Uh, entropy inequality gives us a local result okay so, and that is easy to prove that is easy to prove. so so fix t positive and take any c1 constant such that c1 is bigger than c by t okay and define this new function v of x t is equal to u of x t 
minus c one x. So c one is this constant we have chosen, and now we show that this v is non-increasing function. Okay, so for that you just compute this. Take any a positive, and you compute this v of x plus a at t, and that is by definition u of x plus a t minus c one x plus a. And now use entropy inequality. So u of x plus a t is less than or equal to u of x t plus a c by t. So that c is appearing here. So you multiply by a and take that u x t other side. And now this u x t minus c one x that is nothing but v of x t. And this one I take a common and c by t minus c one. And by our choice of the constant c one, so this is always less than or equal to zero, and that gives us v of x plus a t is less than or equal to v of x t. So v is a non-decreasing function, so it is a function of bounded variation that we have already seen it. And same thing is true with c one x. So this is again a monotonically increasing or decreasing function depending on the sign of c one. Okay, so hence that is also a bounded variation function, and u being the sum of these two functions of bounded variation is also a bounded variation function. So bounded variation, the class of bounded variation functions, they form a vector space. So this sum is also a, a vector, uh, bounded variation function. So this uh, entropy inequality. Implies certain regularity on the solution U, of course, for t positive. So similar to the one we observed in heat equation. Okay, so initially U zero may be very very rough. It's only assumed that it's a bounded measurable function, and even in the case of heat equation, so the initial condition can be just a bounded function, but there. For t positive, the solution suddenly becomes solution given by the Fourier Poisson uh, formula becomes c infinity. Of course, here c infinity is not there, but some smoothness is there. Okay. Okay. Now we continue to verify this. Uh, Function given by the Lax-Wolinik formula is a weak solution. Okay, so again recall that u of x t is given by this f prime inverse. So this is again functional inverse. Let me repeat that. So at x minus y x t by t. Okay, so we need to verify this integral relation for all test functions phi. Okay. And again, connection between uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation uh, and conservation law comes into play. So you remember, so this u is d by d x of w, okay, which I write just w x, and w is solution of the hamilton jacobi equation and uh, w is a lipschitz function so it's differentiable almost everywhere so it satisfy this hamilton jacobi equation point wise okay now you pick up any test function phi okay and multiply this hamilton jacobi equation by phi x so this is A partial derivative with respect to x. So phi, remember, phi is function of x and t, and it has support in a rectangle in R two plane. Okay. So this notation I already introduced in previous class. It just means this. Okay, this double integral. T positive means this. Okay, so you multiply by phi x, 
and integrate over t positive. That means this. Okay. So again, now we want. So you consider, for example, the first term. First term here. Just I want to integrate by parts. So, so you have to justify that. So integrate. These are some subtle issues, but you have to pay attention. Otherwise, we start thinking that these are all smooth functions. So there is no need to worry. But they are not. Integration by parts is justified. That's why I listed those facts from the analysis. So why it is justified? So W is a Lipschitz function, so hence it is absolutely continuous function. Okay. So first I integrate by parts with respect to t variable here. Okay. So just consider only t variable here, so that <coughs> will not touch the x integration. So that W t, so I take that t. To and phi is a smooth function. That's a test function. So that's a C1 function. So integration by parts is justified. So I take that t derivative to phi. And since it's a t derivative, there is a boundary 0 here. It is not minus infinity. So a boundary term appears here. Okay. And that is the initial condition. So W0. Okay. So this is integration by parts with respect to t variable. First you do that. With respect to t. And now you do integration by parts with respect to x. Okay. So just so essentially what we are doing is we are exchanging this t derivative to phi and x derivative to w. Only thing is we have to exercise little caution and justify the integration by parts. Okay. And similar thing I do in the second integral. Okay. So if you now do integration by parts with respect to x variable and now the x integral varies from minus infinity to infinity and phi is a test function it vanishes uh, at both infinity and minus infinity so there are no boundary terms here so we will only get minus 0 to infinity minus infinity to infinity wx phi t dx dt and similarly with the single integral here so we get minus w0 x uh, and remember this w0 is absolutely continuous just pay attention to all these things that implies w0 is absolutely continuous and that is the minimum sufficient condition for the integration by parts to hold. Okay, now you put together all these things and again in this one, so we are not touching this second term at all, so only the first term, so now you have computed that, now you put back Again, yeah, here I have written again. And this W0x equal to U0 almost everywhere. Okay, and now you put back all these conditions, uh, all these computations into 1. Okay, and remember U is Wx. Okay, that is lacks in the formula. We get U phi t plus f of U phi x dx dt 
and integral t equal to 0 u 0 x y x 0 dx and that is precisely the definition of peak solution. So u given by the lax volume formula is indeed a weak solution of the conservation law. I will take up the entropy inequality uh, next time. Thank you.